reading this morning from the Epistle of Paul to the Romans and chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness." For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you then have in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless his word to us this morning. Let's turn again to Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Not all who profess to be Christian live like Christians. In fact, none of us lives as we should live. What is particularly serious about this is that some Christians don't seem to care about that. When a Christian falls and fails, then he or she is upset and sorry and ashamed and asks God's forgiveness, and and part of true repentance is a resolution not to fall again. But there are so many who claim to be Christian, and maybe they are, but they appear to have a very casual attitude toward the commandments of God and obedience to God, and they sit lightly to these things, and to all outward appearance, their lives appear to be very similar to those around them who profess no faith in God, whatever. Now, that isn't a new problem. In fact, it is something that the Apostle Paul is dealing with here in Romans chapter 6. Not only were some people in the church at Rome careless about obedience, but they were defending their carelessness. Uh, Not only were they not ashamed of it, but they were boasting in it. They were proud of it. And even worse than that, they were seeking to claim uh, the support of the Apostle Paul for the way they were living ungodly lives. They were saying that they were following Paul's teaching and they were just doing what Paul had taught them to do. Paul has just been teaching, as we've seen in earlier chapters, about God who justifies the ungodly. And these people were saying that that must mean that it doesn't matter if we're ungodly, that God will justify the ungodly. Paul has been teaching that God gives great grace to great sinners. In chapter 5, verse 20, where sin abounded, Grace abounds much more. The more sin, the more grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So you can see the logic of these people and the way they were thinking. They were saying the more sin, the more grace there's going to be. That's what Paul is teaching, they say. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more because Paul has taught us that uh, our lives will be full of grace if our lives are also full of sin. So that's how they were justifying their position. So verse 1 is the statement that these people were making. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what they were saying. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If God gives grace to overcome sin, then the more we sin, the more grace will be given to us. If we were not saved um, by our own righteous living at the beginning, why should we be bothered about righteous living now? So either they believe that that's what Paul was actually teaching, or they thought that that was the inevitable consequence of what Paul had been teaching, that this is what Paul's teaching leads to. They thought, And, of course, that is a charge that has always been leveled and brought against the preaching of the gospel of God's free grace. Uh, throughout history, this is how people have responded and objected to the gospel of grace, that it leads to ungodliness. They say, if you tell men and women and boys and girls that they are saved by the free grace of God alone to sinners— then they will live careless and sinful lives. And Paul responds to that suggestion, uh, and he rejects it out of hand. Certainly not, he says in verse 2. The old AV translation, God forbid, is a very poor translation at that point. The word God doesn't appear in the Greek text, and nor does the word forbid. Uh, so it's, it's not a good translation. It's not accurate at all. Certainly not, says Paul. 
But on what basis does Paul reject this erroneous idea? He does so by explaining the doctrine of sanctification. He's talking about holiness. And this is of vital practical importance to all of us. None of us, I take it here, would argue as the people were at Rome. I'm sure that we don't, or I certainly hope that you don't think and argue in that way. But we ought to be sensitive about this false charge that is brought against gospel churches so often and the preaching of God's free grace. The fact is that when you look at the lives of some people who claim to be Christian, and even when you look at those who claim to be evangelical, and evangelical churches, and see how people live their lives, how worldly and thinking their behavior sometimes is. There's clear grounds for this charge to be made, isn't there? So this is a very relevant issue for us, and quite apart from the failings and the faults that we might see and identify in others, what about our own sins? We should be concerned about our own sins, and we should want to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul deals with this question from two standpoints, as it were. First of all, in verses 1 to 14, from the standpoint of Christian doctrine, and then secondly, from verse 15 to the end of the chapter, from the standpoint of Christian experience. And we'll look at the first of these this morning. And he begins with the key statement that's there in verse 2, which lies at the heart of the Bible's doctrine of sanctification— Verse 2, he says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And the first thing to notice there is our new identity. Our new identity. Paul speaks of we who died to sin. A Christian is someone who has died to sin. That's a description of a Christian. He or she is someone who has died to sin. Now, last week we saw another great description of the Christian. In the second part of Romans 5, we saw that the Christian is someone who was born in Adam, but who has been taken out of Adam and put into Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of God of the Son of His love. So it's not something primarily that we do. It's something that God does. Something that God does to us. He takes us out of Adam and He puts us into Christ. So it's not a matter, first and foremost, of what we experience, what we feel, what we sense in ourselves, but it's a matter of our status and our standing before God and how God sees us and how God deals with us. We are members of a new people. We are members of a new humanity with a new representative, a new covenant head. And God now deals with us on an entirely different basis. Before we were Christians, his dealings with us were all through Adam. Now all his dealings with us are through Jesus Christ. We are in Christ. We have an entirely new existence. We inhabit a new world, as it were. In other words, as Christians, God gives us a radically new identity. And that new identity is the foundation of sanctification. And so in thinking about these things, we need to realize that justification and sanctification are not two separate things. They are different from each other. Justification is an act, whereas sanctification is a work. But they are intimately joined together so that they, ca- they, they are not to be separated. We are not to separate salvation and holiness. They are part and parcel of the same thing. We tend to divide them. When we're thinking theologically, when we think doctrinally, we tend to divide these things. We might look at the doctrine of salvation, and uh, we take the doctrine of justification by faith, and we study that, and then we say, well, I understand that uh, now, so I'll, I'll go on now to look at something different and new. I'll study how people become holy. So Romans 5, justification. Romans 6, sanctification, a new topic. Well, it's a mistake 
for us to think of these things in that way. That's the wrong way to approach the subject. Because God, when he deals with us, doesn't do a number of separate, isolated things to us. He does one thing. It's one great, magnificent work. And it all hangs together. And it all belongs together. You can't divide it up so that you have one part of God's work done in you without the other. You can't be justified without being sanctified. So if you're not sanctified, well, there's a sign that you've never been justified. God does all these things together in us, and it's one great act. So God places us in Christ, and we are to become increasingly like Christ because we're already in Christ. So our holiness is based on our new identity as Christians. So the doctrine of sanctification is saying to us, be who you are. Be who you are. You are in Christ. Behave as if you're in Christ, because that's where you are. Live out your new identity as a Christian. So let's take as an example, uh, someone's got a, a son, perhaps 23 or 24 years of age, and he's He's worked for a few years, he's got some money together, he's bought himself a car and he goes off down to Asda's for something or Tesco and he comes back and he's crying the rain and he's sobbing because someone has gone past his car with a trolley and they've put a scratch on the bumper and there he is and he's crying. And his dad says to him, well come on man up, be a man. He wouldn't say it to him when he was three years of age. Be a man now. Man up. But he's not in his infancy. He's now in his 20s. He is a man. So his father says, now behave like a man. You're asking him to behave like that because that's consistent with his identity. And this is how holiness comes to us. What is your identity as a Christian? Paul describes you as we who have died to sin. And Paul uses an indefinite relative pronoun here. And that emphasizes a characteristic quality, a distinguishing mark. So this isn't just a simple statement that we died to sin. But he's saying, this is your special and distinguishing characteristic. This is your birthmark as a Christian. This is the thing that really marks you out as belonging to God. You have died to sin. This is something that is true of every Christian. And he amplifies that in verses 3 to 10 where he speaks about our union with Christ in his death and resurrection. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ lived in this world in which he was surrounded by sin. He saw sinful things every day. He heard sinful things. He mixed with sinful people. So he was conscious of sin every day. And he was tempted every day. And he suffered because of sin. And then he died. And he was buried. And that burial marked a definitive break with this world of sin. He was finished with this world of sin. Look at what he says in verse 10. The death that he died, he died to sin Once for all, he will never come back into this world in the same way again. He will never live in the presence of sin again. He will never be tempted by sin again. He will never suffer for sin again. His relationship with sin was ended by his death once and for all, says Paul. And because we have been joined to this Christ, and we are now in Christ we too have died to the world of sin. Our connection with it has been broken decisively and forever. We have been taken out of Adam and we're never going back into him. And we can say not only has Christ died for us, but we died in him. We died in him. He died and We died in him to the world of sin. And Paul wants to make that so clear and unmistakable to us that he says it six times. 
in the space of six verses so that we don't miss miss the point he's making. Verse 2, we who died to sin. Verse 3, we were baptized into his death. Verse 4, we were buried with him. Verse 5, we have been united together in the likeness of his death. Verse 6, our old man was crucified with him. Verse 8, we died with Christ. So over and over again he says, we have died. We have died. And when someone dies, they cannot continue the old relationship that they once had before death. That's why death is such a grief to us. Death is separation. We don't see them again in this world. We're not going to hear their voice. We're not going to talk to them again in this world. They have died, and we are separated from them so long as we're on this earth. And Paul is saying to us, this is what has happened to us in Christ, so that we can no longer continue to have our old relationship with sin. Our union with Christ means that we died with Christ. But not only did Jesus die, but he was raised. And he was raised to a wonderful new existence, a new world, everlasting life. As he says in verse 10, the life he lives, he lives to God. And because we've been joined to Christ, we too have been raised to a new life, to a different world. Verse 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we also should walk in newness of life, he says. Verse 5, we shall be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 8, we shall live with him. And what those phrases are saying to us, what they're doing is showing to us the magnitude of salvation. We've left the old world. We have entered a new world just as Jesus has done. That is our identity as Christians. So let's go back to that original question. Shall we continue in sin? Well, says someone, well, there's nothing wrong, surely, with sinning. I don't see any wrong in it. God is gracious, and God will forgive me my sins. Uh, what's, What's the problem? What does it matter if I go on living in the world like the world? After all, God is merciful. Why should I be concerned? Paul says, What are you talking about? Shall we go on living in that old world, motivated by its impulses and craving its pleasures and working for its rewards? You've been taken out of all of that. You've been delivered from that. You're not there anymore. That's not who you are any longer. You're in Christ now. Imagine an engineer in the Royal Navy, and he works most of his career on, uh, on destroyers. And when he has his break time, he goes up on deck for a few hours and takes some fresh air. But then he leaves destroyers, and he starts to work on submarines. And on his first break, he goes to his, his friend, and he says, do you fancy a stroll on deck? And his friend looks at him and says, uh, we are 500 meters under the sea. Don't you realize that we're in a new environment now, a new world, that there can be no strolling on deck now? That's the kind of thing Paul is saying. This is his answer. A Christian is someone who has been removed from the realm and the dominion of sin. So how can you continue now to live in that realm from which you've been taken? Paul is saying, are you seriously asking the question? It ought to be obvious. So if you're living in the world today, if you're comfortable in the world living as you used to live before you professed faith in Jesus Christ, the question is, have you ever really been taken out of it? If you see no problem in living a disobedient, careless life, have you really got the life of Christ in you at all? Do you understand what a Christian is? Think of it like this. Here's a faithful husband. He goes abroad on 
on business and he's going to be away for a month or two and a colleague at work says to him, it's an opportunity for you to have some fun. You can find a girl out there. Your wife will never find out. She's not going to have you followed. She'll never know. You can do whatever you want to do. But he says, you obviously don't understand. You don't know what love is. You don't know what marriage is. You've no idea of the bond that there is between myself and my wife. You don't know what you're talking about. What you're suggesting is unthinkable. Not because I cannot do it, but because I would never do it. Not because I'm afraid I'll be caught, but because of who I am and because of who she is. That can never happen. The very suggestion betrays your ignorance of me and of my wife. Shall we continue in sin, says Paul? It is a total contradiction of your identity as a Christian. So I have to say to you this morning that if you are playing with sin and if you're tolerating it in your life, if you're living a careless, disobedient life, then you have to ask yourself seriously, am I a Christian at all? Because if you're living carelessly and disobediently, you're not living as a Christian. And you're not displaying the characteristics of a Christian. And that brings us to the second thing, which is our, res- our responsibility, a new responsibility. Our new identity, our new responsibility, verses 11 through 14. And the issue that he deals with here is the how. How do you live a Christian life? How do you live a holy life? How do we live lives free from sin. It's all very well to say we've been taken out of Adam and put into Christ and that we have a new identity, but we're still tempted and we still have sin in our hearts and we still struggle with temptation and so on and it's a real battle for us and it can be hard going. So how do we do it? And Paul gives us three pieces of advice. The first thing he says is realize your true position. Realize your true position. And this is highly important. This is vital. Did you notice how in this passage the apostle keeps on using the verb know? Verse 3, do you not know? Verse 6, we know. Verse 9, we know. So in the battle for holiness, we begin by asking, what do I know? What do I know to be true about myself? And then there's that great statement in verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what's interesting is that is the very first imperative verb that you find in the epistle to the Romans. It's the first commandment the first thing that you're told to do by Paul in this book. Five and a half chapters have gone by before we're told to do anything. And the first thing we're told to do, learn, understand, believe, realize, and know. And only then are you going to be able to do anything. We need to think of ourselves, he's saying, in this way. We need to remind ourselves of this over and over again. We need to understand it. We need to remember it so that we begin to act upon what is the reality of what Christ has done for us through grace. Reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. Every morning when you get up, every time you face temptation, you must say to yourself, this is what I am. I am dead to sin, and I am alive to God. We are to know these things. We are to realize that these things are true. Our mind is to so grasp the significance of our death and resurrection with Christ that the thought of a return to the old life is unthinkable. Has your mind grasped that reality? Have you so fastened upon this reality that it dominates and controls the way you think about yourself and the world. I have died to sin. I am alive to God. I am a new man. 
I'm a new man. It's the failure to grasp, you see, that glorious reality about ourselves that explains the despondency that you see in so many Christian lives, rather than joy. And it's this that explains the weakness that is in so many Christian lives, rather than strength that they should know in Christ. We forget what blessed people we are, what privileges we have. We forget what God has done for us and in us. We forget that we've been totally changed by his grace and that we are new men and new women. Here is the motivation for holiness. It is an awareness of what God has done for us in Christ. One of the great men of church history was Augustine, a North African theologian uh, who lived before he was converted, a very wicked and dissolute life. And one day after he was converted, he saw a woman in the street with whom he had previously had a, a relationship. And she walked over to him, and in a very provocative way, she stood before him and said, It is I, Augustine. And he looked at her and says, Yes, but it is not I. I am not who I was. And you don't know the man that I am now. I'm a new man. I'm a different man. So Paul says, realize, realize, reflect, reckon, think upon this, pray it into your heart and mind. This is true of me. I am dead to sin. So how can I possibly entertain it now? And then the second piece of advice he gives is to refuse, verses 12 and 13, refuse to serve the old master. He says there, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. So here's the strong negative of holiness, simple and vital, just say no. That was a slogan, wasn't it, used by the Reagan administration back in the 80s on its, in its war against drugs, just say no. Paul says, every time you're confronted by sin, just say no. Say no to sin always. No, 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 I will not serve you. I will not obey you. I will not listen to you. Sin has no claim on us. Satan has no power to, condemn, uh, to compel the child of God to sin say no. He likes to deceive us. He, he likes to make us think that we have to sin and that we have to obey him, but that's not so. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his sermons on this chapter, uses the illustration of a slave in 19th century America who escapes from his master and heads north. And as soon as he crosses the border, he's a free man. He has no master. Nobody owns him any longer. But one day in the street he sees his old master who calls across to him and says, Come here, boy. And he starts to walk across the street towards his old master who had previously so cruelly treated him and beaten him. And then he suddenly stops and he thinks to himself, He's not my master any longer. I'm a free man. I don't belong to him. I don't have to listen to him I don't have to do what he says. I am a free man. And Paul says that that is what you and I are to do with sin. We're not to listen to it. We're to keep refusing to obey it. The Bible talks about mortifying sin, putting sin to death, of denying sin. So we're to realize who we are in Christ and we're to refuse to obey the old master. We've been delivered from the dominion of sin and we're to grasp that fact, and we'll find that to be the most effective motive against temptation and sin. You don't have to sin. I don't have to give in to it. And then the third piece of advice that he gives is to rededicate. Rededicate. Verse 13. Do not present your members as instruments of righteousness, unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Realize who you are in Christ, uh, reckon yourself dead to sin, and rededicate 
You see, the negative alone is not enough. And so Paul gives us here a great positive. Present, don't present yourself to sin, but present yourself to God. When you're tempted by evil thoughts, in other words, think good thoughts. The negative isn't enough. It has to be combated with the positive. When you're tempted to look at what is evil, well, combat that by saying no, and then look at what is good. If you're tempted to sin when you're alone, well, don't be alone. Keep company with others. If there are people who entice you to evil, seek other friends who instead will build you up. You see, just to sit back and to say no to sin, no, 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 that, that is a real mistake because the devil is far more patient than you. He can wait. He'll outweigh you and he'll wear you down. But the answer is to say, no, I will not sin in that way. Rather, I am going to do this. And you replace the negative with a positive. It's not just a matter of refusing to give yourself to the devil, but you must actually give yourself to Christ. Heart, mind, hands, your entirety, you give to Christ, spending our days in his service, seeking to please him in all things. And if we do that, we will no longer be easy prey for the devil. And Paul ends, doesn't he, here with this liberating promise. He's saying to us, you can be holy. We will be holy. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Why is that so? For you are not under grace, uh, not under law, but under grace. That doesn't mean that you're not subject to the law of God and his commandments. But Paul is talking about the dominating force in a believer's life. You are not in Adam. You are not under the condemning law of God. When God looks at you, he does not say, if you're a Christian, has he obeyed? Has she obeyed? He sees us in Christ, and he says, he has obeyed. So what is true of you if you're a Christian is that grace reigns in you, and it will bring you to perfection. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. The Lord bless his word to us this morning.